Welcome to the third episode of The Wide World of Wayne. I'm Wayne Viner. Along with me is my engineer, Will Beach. And coming in later is Cordell Woodland. You've heard him as our producer on Turp Talk and the Sports Maven on 1300 CBS Sports Radio. He'll be in to share his thoughts on Maryland football and basketball and a little bit on the Redskins. want to start off today's podcast uh, looking at two major topics. One, to talk about Media Day. I was in Chicago yesterday for the Big Ten Basketball Media Day. And then secondly, even though it's still football season, um, unfortunately Maryland football falling to second on the list in our hurry, a little bit of a look back at Penn State and a look ahead to this weekend's game in Piscataway, New Jersey against the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. So, I'm going to start off with Media Day. Yesterday was a star-packed day in Chicago. Got to see all 14 coaches. They brought select players. All the media showed up. It was a gold-plated event for the Big Ten, and they do these events very well. They stay on time. Access is easy. Everybody wants to talk hoops. Got a chance to talk to Jeff Goodman, who was with ESPN and now is with the Stadium Network, and Jimmy Jackson, who's on BTN. And everybody has major ups and props for the Maryland Terrapins, uh, primarily because of a football phrase of deep depth. Maryland is loaded with talent. The question has been, can this talent compete at the highest level? Can Turgeon coach at that level? Can Cowan share the ball? Is Sticks ready for prime time? How do you get from a team that had some shaky moments at the end of games to want to take the next step? And there is a step to take in College Park. Uh, Whether or not you have Maryland in your top five or top seven, which a lot of people do, I think there's still questions from the Maryland fan base Can this team actually get it done? Can Turgeon get it done? And if not this team, then what would it take? I think this is the best chance that Maryland has had to reach the heights of college basketball in the entire Turgeon era. It's homegrown talent. We're not looking at a bunch of transfers. These kids have played together. You can't use youth as an excuse anymore. You can't say that they're thin at any position at the moment. This is the team. Those who have seen Jalen Smith up close uh, say that his nickname has changed. They don't call him Sticks anymore. They call him Logs now. He has gotten that big. He has gotten so big, muscular, that Turgeon mentioned in an interview session with me that they've had a cut back on the weight training. He was putting on too much weight. It's going to hurt his knees. So that, I guess, is progress. Terps are going to come out bigger stronger. You hope they can weather the storm of the Big Ten, a very physical league. Those who have seen Ricky Lindo say that he could be a Dennis Rodman clone. Go in there and get every rebound. If you put him out there, he's going to match, pretty much matches minutes with rebounds. So if you put him in the game for 15 minutes, maybe he gets 10 rebounds. I mean, he can be a rebounding machine. question is, will he? Does Daryl Morsell actually find peace in his role? Both Turgeon and a little bit of Morsell saying that he's, he's good with this situation as being Maryland's glue guy. Maryland needs to do everything. Maybe Daryl Morsell is that guy in his junior season. The real focus is going to be on the Cowan. Can he temper the scoring, use the scoring in a surgical way while becoming a great ball distributor? It is said he can be a defensive stopper. It was hard to be a defensive stopper when you're going to be out there for 40 minutes. If you use all your energy on defense, you don't have it left for offense. Now, if managed properly, if you get the right number of minutes, using Eric Ayala as a backup, or maybe a Sorrell Smith, you can play and plan to play an Anthony Cowan for 30 minutes. Keep him as a high-energy guy. He could score 
but it's just as important for him to play defense, to be a defensive star and a great distributor. So Ben Page said, you know, if he can get 15 points and 7 assists and few turnovers, you really got a shot here. Speaking of shots, you've got Aaron Wiggins. This is a kid that came into Maryland being a pro prospect as a tall shooting guard. He hasn't seen the floor enough. I saw him play with Cowan at the Kenner League in Georgetown, and it's a, it looks like a good pairing. A small, fast point guard, a taller, lankier outside shooter. Wiggins has been projected on some draft boards inside the top 20 in, the, in next year's draft. But I'm not sure where the minutes are really going to come from. Turge says he's going to start him. I think Wiggins is your X factor. I've seen a lot of kids come in here and say they can shoot. And then once they get here, they can't really shoot that well. Uh, I've seen others that were underused. Uh, the Red Mamba, Kevin Herter, was really underused. He's blossoming as a pro in Atlanta. He couldn't get enough of the ball in College Park. you got to give Wiggins the ball if he really can score like that. He has to be the primary option. You can use sticks down low, uh, once again, as a center. Or the power forward if you go really small, and that, that's your big guy. If he gets you 12 points and 10 boards, that's fine. In this year, in this league, with this outside shooting, teams that just can live by the three-point shot, even though the lines move back a little bit, and you think of the guys that still play fast, Purdue, Indiana, Maryland's sort of a slog to 60, first to 60 wins in the Big Ten. If you're really going to make it, I think that's got to go by the wayside. I think you have to use the number of players you have to your advantage, you have a team that can press the whole game. You have enough backups if somebody gets in foul trouble. You've got enough depth if somebody actually gets tired. We haven't even gotten to Eric Ayala, who would probably be the starting point guard on most teams. Here, you're going to look at him coming off the bench. Um, it's a loaded team. I'm not going to go player by player, but there's 10 guys that can legitimately play here. I hope that Coach Turgeon finds a way to get them the right number of minutes and that this team grows and that becomes the powerhouse that Maryland can be. If you do those things, if this team wins, that Xfinity Center will be rocking. One of the most fun questions to ask opposing players and the Maryland guys is other than your home court, what's the best place you get to play at in the Big Ten? Invariably, Purdue came on everybody's list, and I've heard from my radio partner, Bruce, that Purdue's just a great place to watch a game. But Maryland, Michigan State both on there, and Maryland because just the, the craziness, the frenetic energy of that crowd, it, it's great. I, I've told the story on the air before of having an autofocus camera being on the floor, and it's so loud in the Xfinity Center, the camera won't focus. It gets knocked off of focus. Those, even though the pictures are blurry, that is the best time. It, it's just, just great. You got to win to get there. Unfortunately, the whole league, all of America, it's a winner's league. If you come out of the gate and you stumble a little bit, this isn't football in, in NCAA football where if you lose a game, you're out. But Maryland needs to use one of the greatest weapons they have, which is that home court advantage, and use that well. And I think you're going to be in the top two of the Big Ten. Uh, things to look forward to. Maryland plays Michigan State twice in 15 days in February. That is going to be a battle of the heavyweights. And with that, we're going to turn our attention to our football Terrapins, which is my, my favorite Maryland team still is the football team. Uh, we will be back after this message. This is the Wide World of Wayne podcast. This is being held in the Viner Four Gate Studio. If you have a small to medium business and you need help with your network, with your internet, if you're afraid of viruses, if you need a new firewall, look to Viner Four Gates. It's run by Terps. You will be served by a Maryland Terrapin. And you can reach 
Viner Four Gates at 301 251 2900 or on the web at oneviner.com. That's the numeral one. V is in victory. I E N E R.com. 301 251 2900 in Rockville. Back here for segment two of the Wide World of Wayne podcast. Will, you went to the game on Friday night. Uh, you stayed in the parking lot longer. I went in with Mason to the press box side. You went more as a fan. What's your take on what you saw out there as the night got started? Well, first off, you have to include the pure fact that the parking lot was full, jam-packed. There was no place to park. Crowd, crazy, starting parties, flags roaring everywhere. So you walk in with thousands of people. It was one, honestly one of the biggest crowds I have seen at a Maryland football game in a very long time. To, it felt You feel proud to be able to walk in as a Terrapin fan and show the blackout until the game started. Yeah, well, a lot of people say that uh, that's it. You know, if you're a fan, you're not going back. You don't trust the team. What's your take on that? Everybody likes to say they're not going to come back, but everybody knows it's your team. You're going to stay there. You're going to represent who you are, and it's just a lot of talk. Yeah, but they're going to have to win. They're going to they're gonna have to earn their right to have fans come back. Uh, Mason went on at great length on the Young Terps podcast. That's also up on terptalk.com. You guys should give that a listen. Um, he's been let down, you could tell. He's really been let down by this. Uh, Jordan and Mason say it's the biggest loss they've seen. And yeah, we got blasted 59 to nothing. And yeah, it was embarrassing. But unfortunately, if you've been around long enough, this has happened before. Maybe not at home and on national television, but the the theme that Mason and I had of this is why you can't have nice things. This is why you don't have sellouts. This is why you don't have crazy fans. This is why you play in a half-empty building is because when you actually get what you asked for, and you better watch out what you asked for because you just might get it, and that is a pounding, pulsing crowd in a glowing stadium that the whole Big Ten said, hey, look at what Maryland's doing. And if that's about the time you got to put your hands over your eyes like it's a horror movie that I've seen too many times. You go, oh, my God, they're not ready. Which led to, oh, my God, I think they quit. And you don't ever, ever want to think that your team quit. But they quit. They were getting the snot beat out of them. They had a quarterback who forgot how to play quarterback. Um, they were up against superior athletic talent. They had a very poor scheme. They didn't manage to double-team Penn State's All-American defensive end. It costs them, and the life went out of the place. And anybody who stayed till the end, and Mason did, I know Will did, um, we had to do a post-game show on the field, and even the Penn State people went home. It was just boring. Uh, but it was horrifying and then boring. And much as I love this team, I'm not there to be horrified. I'm not there to wish I didn't go. Uh, there was no channel to change. And there was no button to push to turn this off. We were committed to being there. And we're not going anyplace. I've been doing this since almost every home game since 1984. I'm not going anywhere. But it was fun to have... 40 or 50,000 people along for the ride. And I remember the first years of Ralph when you had 50,000 in the building and you had some miraculous wins. And I had hope beyond hope, and I know been told I drank too much of the Kool-Aid, but a lot of that was love and hope. I had hoped that I was seeing a resurrection of a program, the one-year turnaround that Ralph Friedgen brought here in the early 2000s, and that's not what I saw. So can Maryland beat Rutgers? Sure. I said this on the radio. I've heard Mason and Jordan say it on Young Terps. There's a but. The but is that Maryland is going to play with three guys who did start on the offensive line uh, at the beginning of the season. One of them's Marcus Miner. He is out. He's a tackle. The other one's Terrence Davis. He's a guard. He's a big dude. And he was the lead pull guard. He's from DeMatha. 
And then there's Johnny Jordan, who went to St. John's College High School, and he's the center, and I think he's probably one of the tougher guys out there, and he's banged up, so he's out. And, and so you have to go and bring in the reinforcements. Ellis McKinney gets to start at center. Austin Fontaine wears the number 55 jersey. You might have remembered him from last year as number 96, who's a defensive lineman. And then I believe it's Spencer Anderson's going to get his first start at tackle. That's going to be hard to run a competent offense with three guys who didn't start. It's going to be hard to, especially hard to do pass protection. When asked what would I do, I said I'd line up my five guys plus my 6'4", 250-pound tight end, and I would run straight at them. I don't want to make this complicated. I want to make it football. I actually want to beat somebody up. If I was on that team, once I got done being embarrassed, that my parents left. I mean, imagine if you're a kid there and your parents went, this is so bad, I'm going home. I want to go out there and kick somebody's rear end. I hope they're angry. I hope they're as angry as people who paid $150 for a ticket to watch that and $100 for a parking pass to watch that. I hope this bruises their pride. I hope it wakes them up. They have some top-tier talent on this team. They just don't play like it. Now, whether that's a hangover from, really, this is the third coach in three years. They went from Durkin. They went to Canada. They went to Loxley. And it, things changed, maybe it changed too much, but that's looking for excuses. At some point, it's about you being a human and responding to this and, and adulting and not wilting from the circumstance that you got your rear end kicked on national TV. It should make you embarrassed and angry and waiting to just beat the heck out of somebody. So I hope we come up with a game plan that plays off of that emotion. And I'm not really concerned that it's Rutgers. I know Rutgers was historically banned. They fired the coach. They fired the offensive coordinator. doesn't really matter who it's against. It's that you want to get back out there and beat somebody. And for once, I'm not going to look two or three games down the road. you got to come out on Saturday and win, or else all of the doubters who said, why did you hire a guy that just doesn't win football games to be your head coach all of that, it's going to be a really loud volume that this was a mistake. You can't lose this game and create that kind of uproar. You just can't do it. But, you know, it's a game, and there's two teams that play, and as Bruce said, somebody's going to win. And you're looking at one team that got beat 52 to nothing playing against a team that got beat 59 to nothing. I don't think I've ever been to a game where the combined score from last week combining the scores of both opponents, that they lost a collective 111 to nothing. But I'm going to New Jersey, and I'm going to see this live and in person, and I really hope that uh, I'm going to be in a victorious locker room with the Terps. And, of course, after every game, you can hear me on 105.7 The Fan and Sports Talk 980, and now 95.9 in Washington, D.C. on the postgame show with Mike Popovic, and then... You will also be able to talk about this on Terp Talk on 1300 CBS Sports Radio next Wednesday night. That's 1300 CBS Sports Radio. Coons Ford presents Terp Talk. And if you don't get a chance to hear that live, you can hear it on the Internet. You can just go to TerpTalk.com. We'll be back with Cordell. Get a little deeper into this. Get a different point of view. In a moment, you are listening to the wide world of Wayne here from the Viner Fourgate studio. We'll be back in a moment. This is Mason Viner. Listen to the Young Terps podcast on CapitalSportsBlog.com and TerpTalk.com, the number one rated Maryland sports podcast. Welcome back to the wide world of Wayne podcast here at the Viner Fourgate studio. Uh, joining us on the phone is Cordell Woodland. He is at the CBS Sports Studios in Baltimore. I'm over in our sub-location in Rockville. Uh, Cordell, welcome into the podcast. Hey, what's going on, Wayne? I'm happy to be here. So you've followed these teams. I mean, anybody who's listened to Turp Talk and the Sports Maven knows that you've been involved in football in a bunch of different sports, but I'm not sure you've gotten any run on this. So... I met Cordell as our producer for the two shows at the studio. I didn't realize that Cordell had covered the Nationals. 
had worked with Morgan State football, has been a Washington sports fan his whole life. So why don't you give a little bit of background on, on what you've done in sports over the past few years? Uh, yeah, Wayne, uh, I, like you said, I used to cover the Nationals, um, really all the D.C. sports team from the Nats to the Wizards, Georgetown, and the Capitals um, at ESPN 980. And I've also done work uh, with Morgan State football. I've actually also had an internship with the Washington Redskins last year. So I was inside the fortress at uh, Redskins Park. Uh, on a daily basis throughout the week, which was a cool experience to see, I guess, a quote-unquote NFL team uh, daily operation. Uh, but, yeah, I've, I've definitely been all over the uh, DMV sports scene for a while now. All right, well, we're going to start you off with one of my favorite topics, usually my only topic, is uh, Maryland. And from afar, you got to see a little bit of the Big Ten Media Day, but you already know that Maryland's thought of very highly in basketball circles this year. What's your take on our Maryland Terrapins? Well, this is the year I think that uh, a lot of Maryland fans uh, have been waiting for. Uh, Maryland basketball has left a lot to be desired over the last few years, especially in the Mark Turgeon era. Um, and fans have grown restless over the last few years, but I think this year, at least building up to the preseason, Maryland seems to be the team that everybody seems to be talking about. Andy Katz had them. Uh, in their top five, they brought in the, a great recruiting class this year, and they're even looking to expand on that last year. I know they missed out on the number one recruit that they wanted. Um, but I know Maryland basketball, recruiting-wise, is still picking up. So this is the year, as far as excitement-wise, I haven't heard this much buzz around Maryland basketball preseason in a while. Well, I got to see the buzz machine uh, up close and personal yesterday. And other than Michigan State, this is the team everybody's talking about. Purdue has fallen off. Maybe Illinois is on the rise. I'm not sure people know where to, to slot your Minnesotas, your Ohio States, but and right. even Michigan with Juwan Howard coming in. I'm not sure where they're going to end up. So the two teams they seem to be focused on is Maryland and Michigan State. And if it ends up being a Maryland-Michigan State battle, one thing that's happened over the past few years, I really didn't like Michigan State. After that game in 2010, when uh, in the grievous years, when when they hit a impromptu three to end the game, uh, just couldn't stand them. But after I've talked to Izzo and gotten to meet the players up close, I actually think they do this right. I have a lot more respect for them. And if it ends up being Maryland, Michigan State, that's going to be a heck of a battle to the end. So uh, with, definitely. with you being in the building at CBS Sports Radio, you get to talk to all the Baltimore sports luminaries, and almost all of them follow Maryland. What right. did you hear in the week that was that followed that embarrassing debacle against Penn State? Man, Wayne, uh, it, it, it was definitely the shot heard all around Maryland. Uh, everybody is basically, at this point, I mean, it's sad to say, everybody's kind of hitting cold red with the team, and maybe not cold red to the point of panic, but like, okay, this is the same old Maryland. And that's what it's starting to transition to because with Josh Jackson at, at quarterback, is, and now a question mark has come up in the position that coming into the season, we felt pretty secure about. Um, so that, that right there, I think, is a huge blow to Maryland, not knowing what their quarterback situation is going to be. But it starts in the trenches. It starts in the O-line. And we saw in the Howard game, as, as much as Maryland dominated Howard, which they were supposed to, uh, the one negative, I guess, you could take from that game was the fact that uh, Josh Jackson was under pressure a lot when he was in the game. And, you know, I heard the players and I heard Coach Loxley bring up a lot about cover zero and how I guess it was giving them issues in that game. But we saw it transition a little bit more the weekend, uh, the next weekend to Syracuse. And then it really showed its ugly head against Temple. Um, and I understand that the injuries are, are really knocking them down. They were already hurt at the position coming into the year, having to transition a lot of defensive linemen over to the offensive side of the ball. But, man, here we are going into uh, the fifth game of the year, and they're, they're still left with question marks as opposed to as, as the fact of they don't know who they're going to put in some of these positions. Ellis McKinney has been used as a swift army knife. He'll be at center this week. 
Um, so Maryland, Maryland issues uh, when it comes to being in the on the front line in any fo- on any football team. If you're having problems on the offensive line or the defensive line, you're you're you as a team are going to struggle. Well, you got the offensive line right there, and for most of the year, Maryland plays two defensive linemen and two linebackers, and that's their front four. So they're not the heaviest right. team up front. They got a lot of speed defensively by scheme on purpose. They're bringing five and six guys because right. they need to create pressure. They need to create havoc. It worked for a couple weeks, but wow. Um, they got burned twice in the Temple game because they put so much and defensive see, pressure it, on, it, and then they got lit up all night against Penn State. And to your point, just like you said, this is a pressure team. They got zero pressure against Penn State, so they were definitely exposed on the back end when uh, – when when the receipt, when when Penn State blew off definitely two big big runs big plays off the uh, quick passing game and the lack of tackling was definitely exposed in that in that game for Maryland as well that was the worst tackling I think I've seen from that team in a long time. Locke said they missed 18 tackles, and, that's, and I could believe it. That's probably true. Look, KJ Hamlin, who wears number one, looks like a small it's a cross between Will Likely and Stephon Diggs. Just right. destroyed Maryland. And even though there's some guys who, who had NFL aspirations as cornerbacks, they could not catch him. They could not tackle him. It, it, it was embarrassing. It looked like we didn't belong in the Big Ten. I agree. So that, I agree. That, but that speaking of speaking of teams that don't belong in the league, we both follow an NFL team. And as you said, let's not use the NFL word to – too much here because the Redskins, right. are, they could be relegated back to college football any minute. Um, have you ever heard a coach come on TV or have a press conference and say he doesn't know who the quarterback is? This being the, it's the middle of the season. What did Jay say? What he said was we have no plan at the quarterback position right now. And that was Wednesday as you're headed into playing the best team in the league, like I said the best team of the last maybe decade this this Patriots franchise has been in the NFL, and you're going into this game 0 and 4, and what you tell the media is you have no plan at quarterback. A part of me really wants to believe that that's just not true because he also stated the day before that he may know who the quarterback was. He just wasn't going to tell the media. So he could be yanking the media's leg, but I, I don't know what to believe anymore, Wayne. It's just a complete circus in uh, Ashburn right now. It's a complete circus. It's, the quarterback position is just one of the many issues we have going on in D.C. right now. But what I think we're seeing is a head coach who has checked out, who has quit on a team that has already quit on him. Um, And now we're just, everybody's playing it by ear just to see what's going to happen after this Patriots game. That's when I think we'll start to see some changes being made. Well, you said on Terp Talk, which is earlier tonight, was it tonight? It was yesterday. 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 Um, With all this travel, I'm getting my days mixed up. (laughs) That uh, you think this is it for Jay. Yeah. And that means... I I do. uh, What... So what have you been hearing, or what, what's your theory of what's going on at Redskins Park? Well, I think it's just time for a change. You have a, this is, you have a rookie quarterback in, and it already seems to be friction between the front office and the coaching staff as, a, as far as the direction you want to go with as far as your quarterback position. Um, and even going back to week one, just the, the healthy scratch of Adrian Peterson, just what it did to the morale of the locker room, um, Players were, were visibly upset about it. You have players coming out publicly talking about it. This is week one, Wayne. We hadn't even played a game yet, and the head coach is already doing things to disturb the locker room. Um, I just think that the dysfunction has reached its head, and when you have uh, the fact that you have a rookie quarterback here, I think now has to be the time because you, we, we, can't, we can't screw this up again. We can't screw this up. We don't know if Haskins is good or not. But what we have to do at least is afford him the opportunity and give him the best chances to be good. And right now, with a 
with a coaching staff that is in limbo. Uh, they barely have a game plan going into the week, it sounds like. What are we doing here? We're talking about starting a Colt McCoy who just broke his leg last last year. He He's been in the league I don't know how many years. We know what Colt McCoy is as a quarterback. At this point, the Washington Redskins, everything they do has to be triggered towards the future. And it just doesn't seem like that's what the coaching staff wants to do right there. And the front office has to make a decision. And the front office is just as in much shambles as the coaching staff is. So the, the, the transition has to start somewhere. Right now, Jay Gruden is the easy target. Um, and he has to be the one, I think, that, that that's going to leave right now. So even if it's not after this Patriots game, I think regardless, the Washington Redskins as an organization, change, big changes have to be made, and it's definitely, the head coaching position is definitely going to be one of them. Well, we can talk about all the other things we know about the uh, joke that and now is the Washington Redskins uh, on the next next episode of the Wide World of Wayne. But for tonight, um, we're going to leave it at that. But I've got my, my parting question for you is, between the two, and I'm going to throw the Ravens in because you hear a lot of Ravens talk, who is right. in the most peril as a football program this weekend between the Redskins, the Terps, and the Ravens? Oh, well, I'm going to take the Ravens out because, you know, at least they have a win on the NFL level. So I'm going to take them out. Um, I'm still going to go Washington because at least Maryland has what seems to be a little tune-up game going up against a Rutgers team who's who's going through as much turmoil as any Division One football program right now. Uh, so it's lined up for Maryland to have a bounce back week. But Washington, you got New England coming in at home. You don't know who your quarterback is. You're banged up all over the offensive line. And, and, and as a team in general, you, you just don't know what, to, what tomorrow holds for you as a team. You don't know if your head coach is even going to be here next week. Uh, so I would definitely have to say that the Redskins is the team that's uh, in in the most trouble. If the Redskins lose, and the Redskins are going to lose, and the yeah. Dolphins lose, we have to have oh. a uh, a mini Super Bowl special. The two undefeated <laughs> teams battle for either Chase Young or Tua Tagliavola, and that'll be the following week. And if you get two no-win teams, that's a must-see game. Oh, Cordell. Definitely. Thanks for joining in. We'll do this again next week. You are listening to the Wide World of Wayne. I'd like to thank Will Beach for the engineering, of course, Viner Forgates for the sponsorship. And remember to listen to Turp Talk Wednesdays on 1300 CBS Sports Radio, The Sports Maven on Saturdays at 9 a.m., and catch the Young Turps whenever you can. Even though I like the Wayne's, uh, Wide World of Wayne podcast, I got to give it to them, the Young Turps have the best podcast on Maryland sports. And as always, thanks for listening.